I saw a bishop lying on the road. I mean the chess piece, not a religious leader who had fallen down, but it still struck me as odd anyways. Usually you see chess pieces in a set, all bundled together, but here that was not the case. There was just a lone black bishop, gathering dust on the side of a busy road. Strange. I thought. I picked it up. It was sort of an impulsive decision, governed by a string of coincidences, making the surrealness of the situation call to me in a strange way. You see, I had just started learning how to play chess. Properly, I mean, not just the pieces, and how they are played, but the theory that underlines every move. And situation. To be frank, chess is so much more complex than I originally surmised. I try to study a new opening and just get overwhelmed by the staggering amount of variations and counterplays that exist. It just seems unfathomable that something so deceptively simple can be so complicated. And so I grabbed the bishop and thumbed it over in my palm. As I slowly smoothed my finger over the piece, I noticed a slight irregularity. It was almost imperceptible, but there was a small ridge that ran around the center of the piece seemingly separating the bishop into two halves. I stared at the bishop for a few seconds before turning both halves into separate directions, which made the middle part give way. The bishop's hat came off from its stand, revealing that the inside of the piece was hollow. Well, hollow except for one thing. There was a small note furled into a roll and tucked inside the bishop. Furrowing my brow, I opened the note to see some words printed neatly on the inside. Pine Ridge Chess Club, Mondays, and Fridays, 10 p.m. to 2 a.m., we're here to satisfy all of your chess needs. Also included in the note was an address for a house about 10 minutes away from where I live. And that was it. No explanation given or extra information provided. It just seemed to be a chess club that met in the middle of the night. Of course, I had to give it a shot. I rolled up to the address at almost 11 that Friday. There were a few cars parked up and down the street and a couple of lights shining through the window of the house. I slowly got out of my car and tentatively judged the situation. There was soft music coming from inside the house, quiet enough so the neighbors wouldn't complain, and yet loud enough to provide a relaxing atmosphere. I promised myself that I would leave at the first sign of any sketchy behavior, but overall everything seemed pleasant. I mean, sure, a chess club that meets in the middle of the night already seems highly suspicious. But not everything has to be bad. After all, why not? Why shouldn't you play chess when you should be sleeping? Life is for living. And this club seemed to embody that in a strange way. And well, I liked that. Having convinced myself that it was going to be alright, I knocked at the door. It was opened almost immediately by a short, balding man, who upon seeing me, quickly pulled me inside. He was wearing a stained white singlet that was a size too small as it draped tightly over his large gut. Although on the heavy side, he seemed to be in all round good shape. It was possible he was an athlete back in years gone by. The knuckles on his right hand were gnarled and deformed, with thin white scars dotted on them. They looked as if they had been stitched together multiple times. The man motioned for me to follow him. I walked with him into a room, which branched off the main hallway. There were a few men gathered around a table and drinking something out of red solo cups. Probably beer would be my best guess. Interestingly enough, there were no chess boards or pieces. As far as I could see, the man who opened the door for me shook my hand firmly. How are you doing? He said. Did Bo send you? He paused for a second, looking at the bishop that I still had in my hand. Ah, of course he did. How else could you find us here? He chuckled and I smiled back nervously. I'd never really been good at socializing with strangers. I was only here for chess, and there didn't seem to be much of that just yet. He looked me up and down. So, how fresh are you? Pretty new, I said. I only started just recently, and thought it'd be fun to join this club. He nodded, as if that was expected. Well, that's what we're here for. Before we start, have you found what your favorite way to begin is? I found that this group can be pretty varied in interests. I guess we all come in with a different mindset. He said that last part with a large exaggeration, almost as if there was some hidden joke behind it that I had not yet grasped the meaning of. Well, I suppose these are the types of people you get when you join some random ass chess club. Oh well, at least there's beer. I thought, the man continued looking at me, expectantly. Oh, right. He asked me a question. What did he say again? Something about my favorite chess opening. Ah, oh, whatever, screw it. 
I'm partial to the Italian's game. I replied in answer to his question. The truth was that it was the only opening that I had memorized enough for it to be a viable playing choice. He began to laugh, a low, hearty chuckle that made his head bob up and down, and the small pockets of fat on the end of his chin shake. He gestured to his friends. Looks like we've got a jokester here. I tried to suppress a scowl. The Italian's wasn't that bad. He jabbed a meaty finger at me. I like you already. Come, and let's get you started for your first round, he said, and began walking down the corridor we came from. I followed him, eager to start my first game. He called back at me. Do you have any to offer right now? One, two, maybe three. I don't expect much from you, seeing as you're new and all, but we like to share here. Keeps things interesting, you know. I paused for a second. What is he talking about? Money. Does he want to gamble on a chess game? I had never gambled on a chess game before. That was kind of strange. Actually, I had never even heard of anyone ever gambling on chess. It just wasn't something you did. But I had money to spare and didn't want to disappoint him either. I can put in 10. I called over to him. He laughed again. And you say you're just a rookie. Well, that's good to hear anyways. He stopped in between two doors, one on each side of him. Before we start, do you prefer white or black? White, I said. In my experience, going first was always better. Always. He nodded and opened the door to his left. All right, have at it then. I'll be waiting for you to finish up. As I walked through the door, I was greeted by dozens of pairs of fearful eyes, shrinking back at the sight of me entering. As they moved, I heard the rough sound of metal chains scraping against each other. In that moment, my heart dropped as I realized something crucial, something that I was too naive to not notice straight away. He was never talking about chess. I flinched as the door behind me snapped shut, coating the room in a dusky darkness. I looked over to the people sitting in the corner, covered in filth, and other more disturbing things. Oxygen seemed to escape my lungs all at once, causing my chest to involuntarily heave. Oh damn, oh damn, I need to get out. I knocked at the door loudly and after no response, opened it myself. The man was further down the hallway, his head turned in my direction. He looked surprised, as if he didn't expect me to come out for a good while. Is everything all good in there, buddy? He said, I, a uh, change my mind. I don't want to do this anymore. I said, hating the fact that my voice was twanged with panic. He looked at me questioningly, you got cold feet then. I can understand. Most people do, at first. He smirked, get back in there, show him who's boss. I shook my head weakly, no, I, I can't. He stood still for a moment, his face reading my own. He looked at me carefully as if judging my intentions. A short flicker of realization flashed through his eyes before he relaxed a little, smiling slightly. Where did you meet Bo? He said, taking a small step forward. I instinctively stepped back out of fear. He continued walking forwards, confidence growing in his strides. I shrank back against the wall. I knew I had to do something. I needed to act if I wanted to leave. I could throw a punch, kick him up the groin, and maybe buy a couple of seconds. But I couldn't. In the moment, I was frozen with terror. I, I met him online, on a chat forum. I stammered out. It was a weird thing to say, but it was my best guess as to how these people met. Plus, the man didn't look too bright anyways. The man faltered for a second, confusion showing in his face. I could see him arguing with himself, almost to the point where I could make out what he was thinking. Obviously, I had said the right thing, but he still didn't trust me. He looked back at me, a decision made. Come with me then, we need to discuss payment. He said gruffly, payment, what's that supposed to mean? He turned around and walked back to where everyone was, keeping his eyes locked on me to make sure I followed him. I went with him. Now was not the time to kick up a fuss. As we entered the room, the other attendees looked at us quizzically. The man I was with shrugged his shoulders and made a face. As he did that, one of the men walked past us and down the hall to do God knows what. I shivered at the thought. The man gestured me forwards to a small side table. The table had a single, dull knife on it and was encrusted with a red, flaky substance from heavy use. It only took one look for me to discern what it was. Blood. A man sat down and placed his hands down on the table, looking at me expectantly. So, since you're new here, this is how it goes. We all have a bit of fun. He gestured behind him, towards the hallway. But then we got to pay our dues. After all, nothing is free in life. I was silent, 
He looked at me carefully. He told me you were able to provide 10 assets. How fast do you think you would be able to provide them? Oh God, does he mean? I'm not sure. I said, he placed a fingernail on the sharp end of the knife. Did you know that it takes 12 hours before it becomes impossible to reattach a finger to the hand? I think that should be enough time. He looked directly up at me. Why don't you sit down? He wants to, what? Cut my finger off. What am I supposed to do? With shaky breath, I sat down, fearing the consequences if I did not. The man grabbed the handle of the knife, and again I noticed his deformed right hand. He had scars from finger reattachment surgery. That fact just made everything worse. It was proof he wasn't bluffing. He grabbed one of my hands and placed the tip of the knife on a fingertip. I instinctively tensed up with fear. I'll let you go off easy since you're new, he said, his voice strangely calm. I think two would be a good start. Try not to squirm. He brought the knife down. Hard, metal sliced through flesh and bone. Pain jolted through my body. I flinched backwards, causing the knife to push down ever deeper. Blood began to spurt from the open wound, dripping down my fingers and pulling on the now brighter stained table. I yelled out in pain. The man raised an eyebrow at me. What? I told you not to flinch. He pulled the knife up and repeated the process with another finger. It was quicker this time, but the pain increased in an unimaginable way, causing me to double over. Holding my hand close to my stomach, hot blood began to cover my shirt, making me feel faint. He grinned at me, holding up my two fingers as if they were a prize from a game. I'll keep these for the moment. He paused, obviously waiting for me to say something. And when I did not, he continued, and you know what the best part about having your fingers are? Insurance. Call the police and expect them to find your fingerprints everywhere. The color drained from my face. Oh God, everything just keeps getting worse. Hey, don't look so downcast. You chose this. You accepted the bishop. This is your life now. He chuckled to himself. And what a life it is. He stood up and gestured to the door. Well, you better get going. Time's already ticking. Oh, and don't try anything. No police. No hospitals. We'll be watching. I can assure you that. He jerked his head over to one of the men sitting nearby, who nodded in reply. It would definitely be best for you to go bring your payment immediately. I stood up, wincing from the pain, and walked up towards the door. I heard unpleasant sounds emanating from further down the hallway. No one else seemed bothered by it. I opened the door slowly and walked through it. No one got up to stop me. Twelve hours. The man called out. I went out and sat in my car for a couple of minutes, shivering from the endless waves of unbearable pain. One of the men walked out of the house and hopped into his car, watching me. It's been about three hours now, and I've drove to a nearby park, and have just been sitting in the car, typing this. The man in the car across from me is beginning to look impatient, wondering what's taking me so long. I don't know what to do. I don't want them to know my address, so I can't go home. I can't get help. I can't do anything. I have 12 hours to abduct 10 people or else. Not that I want to do that. I'm seriously screwed. 